number 10, veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing. They're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. For people with dirty mouths, they refuse to get their mouths dirty. What do I mean? While while some factors of the Wild West were a free for all, one thing agreed upon across the board of the Wild West was that oral pleasure was just a little too exotic. This finding is documented by Chad Heap's novel Slumming Sexual and Racial Encounters in American Nightlife, 1885 to 1940, and states that the euphemism and cowboy slang for the act was the word French. It's not as if it wasn't anywhere else in the world or just had recently become a thing. The act had existed in many regions and goes far back into the BCs. It just seems that people in the Wild West felt it was a little too European for their liking. In fact, oral was so sparse that even the painted ladies were against it, shunning other workers who performed it and refusing to associate or even eat with them. Well, it's time to get freaky deaky, so let's talk contraceptives. Because it wasn't going in here or back there in the Wild West days, so ladies had an issue on their hands if they wanted to avoid a pregnancy but still wanted a literal romp in the hay. Especially since condoms did exist but they were super expensive, so people had to find out prevention methods. Methods. Pregnancy and childbirth were incredibly dangerous at the time, and with so few women, it became a dangerous game to even get pregnant. In fact, many women on the frontier passed during childbirth. Women were often left with the choice of life-ending pregnancies or noxious substances to prevent or diminish a pregnancy. These substances were also deadly and contained toxic ingredients, often from plant sources, that would end unwanted or simply prevent egg fertility. The long-term side effects were many women, especially those who worked in brothels and ingested these substances more 
more frequently, would become infertile completely. Ovarian cysts were also a side effect as well as hemorrhage or organ failure from overexposure to these poisons. It's sad, but in the wild west, many women had to decide whether to have a baby or the high risk of possibly dying giving birth. Contraceptives, unspoken rules of oral, it seems like it could be hard to learn your birds and bees. Number 5. The Bedroom Trial So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened, you had to do it, even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number 4, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package. Well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place, like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, 
it wouldn't be surprising. This right could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village, even if they didn't want to get married. It was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dwight the Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Wards of the King. This messed up marriage tradition comes from the Dark Ages, the medieval times, and during these times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy female heiresses, as well as wealthy widows, all became Wards of the King. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the King used these people to his advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord who would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on her own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? In our number 9 spot today we have the Bridal Bouquet. The Bridal Bouquet is definitely a classic staple in western society now, but it wasn't always just a nice aesthetic touch. The idea of the Bridal Bouquet has a much different history. It is said that ancient Greek brides would often wear wreaths of mint and marigold meant to serve as an aphrodisiac for the newlyweds, but I want to take us over to the middle ages. During this time, things and people were filthy. The concept of hygiene didn't really exist in the way that it does now and this meant that people were usually pretty smelly. This is why it became tradition for brides walking down the aisle to carry a bouquet that was full of herbs like dill and garlic. The bouquet served as a sort of deodorant for the bride, and it also worked to ward off evil spirits. Sort of like an awesome two for one deal right there in one bouquet. Dill was also like a triple whammy because apparently it too is considered an aphrodisiac, so having some on hand post nuptials pre consummation was just the icing on the cake for the pair. In our number eight spot today, we have the bridal veil. There are a lot of historical wedding traditions that have to do with warding off evil spirits. People were really concerned about that back in the day. This is one of the major factors behind why the bridal veil was created. Back in Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamium, which was meant to look like fire so as to scare off any evil spirits that were lurking around. In Greece, the veil was often yellow for the same reason. Over time, the color changed, but the intent remained the same. It was worn as a sort of protection. In the end, another reason for the use of the veil was to assist in arranged marriages. What I mean by this is that back in the day, when marriage was simply more of a business exchange than anything, sometimes veils were used to hide the identity or appearance of the bride from the groom. Definitely not the most kind tradition there's ever been. In our number 7 spot today we have wedding rings. Both wedding and engagement rings are common in our society today, but this practice has been around for quite some time, although it used to mean a very different thing. The tradition of wedding ring exchange can be traced back to ancient Rome, but it wasn't an exchange that happened between partners at the wedding ceremony, and was instead something that was given by Roman men to the father of the bride as a symbol of his purchase. This practice later evolved into the bride being given a gold ring that she would wear, which was meant to symbolize the fact that the groom had placed his trust in her. He was trusting her with his property. As for the reason we wear rings on our fourth finger, well, rings have been worn on many fingers throughout history, but the reason why this finger was chosen was because it was believed that the fourth finger held a vein that led to the heart, which in Latin was called the vena amoris, or the vein of love. In our number 6 spot today we have the bridal auction. Ancient Mesopotamia had a slew of rules and customs regarding marriage. There's one thing that the Roman historian Herodotus recorded quite well. While many of his stories are largely unreliable, this is one ancient wedding custom that has thankfully been lost to time. The bridal auction was exactly what it sounds like. It was an annual market where young, available women were auctioned off to be married. Those who were considered more beautiful were auctioned off first, and those who were deemed less desirable were auctioned after, along with a quote, monetary compensation, which was said to make up for their appearance. Harsh. Some of the most wealthy men in the area would come to the auction to find the most attractive girl possible, but even some of the men without a bunch of money came to bid a bit later in the game. Number 5. 
The Bedroom Handbook. Like previously said before, when you marry someone, it's for life. You learn to love and you do the bedroom dance with that same person for the rest of your life. For some folks, this was their first time. And as we all know, remember, that can be awkward. <sighs> well, imagine if you had a booklet or an instruction manual on what to do when that time comes. Like a Lego manual. Although sometimes even those can be a little confusing. I always have to count the pieces. I get it confused. Well, some churches back in the oldie times were doing such a thing. The Sume Confessorum, as it was known to be called. It detailed exactly on what days were allowed to make the devil's dance possible. By the time all the rules were read and followed, you were boiled down to a small window about once a week, or sometimes none at all. And especially not on Sundays. Ooh, you better not do that on Sunday, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the wrong time to do it. Never do it on Sunday. Number four, Dragonborn? This is actually kind of cool. So in Viking and Norse weddings, there was a very unique tradition. We'll call it a tradition where the very handsome and brave groom would be tasked with a quest. Like something right out of Skyrim, actually. The groom was tasked with entering his family tomb and retrieving and or placing a ceremonial blade that acknowledges him tying the knot. Now, is that as cool as fighting off drogers and emptying literally every urn you see in search of golden amethyst? No, no it's not. However, I can't recommend entering anyone's grave before the invention of modern medicine. It's just not a great idea, but still cool nonetheless. Hence, it's on the list. Listen, I just got married. You own grandpa's tomb, go grab that knife. Just go in there. Just go grab it. Grandpa died of smallpox. That's okay though. Go in there and grab it, no problem. You come out, <laughs> I got it. And anyway. You see where romp in the sack comes from now though? So how about after those I do's? It's out in the open. As forementioned, I would return to the topic of semi-public adult acts and here we are. What a fun place to be. You know what isn't fun? In the wild west most families lived in small houses usually made up of one large room. So naturally when it came down to it every member of a family sharing space privacy wasn't very possible. Yeah this isn't the fun and flirty voyeur stuff we were talking about. This is more in like grandma's range of vision. In this case it's fair to question how they would get intimate when sleeping in a bed with other relatives. Having more space meant having more money. A type of privacy afforded by class. Money meant privacy and in the wild west there wasn't much money. Meaning shared rooms or houses and finding strategic ways to get off in privacy. Author Brian Watson explained how the American West and North America as a whole went from a mindset of comfort to one of more sheltered as it is now. He cites that during Reformation, figures such as Martin Luther King created a sanctity of privacy surrounding intimacy, something previously non-existent. What's scandalous to us now was more normal to them than how we choose to live. Here's a weird one I didn't expect to learn about in research. Mail order brides. The Wild West had mail order brides. Yeah, not something I would have guessed, but it makes sense. Female populace was next to none, and sure, with more men around than you can choose from, some were fortunate enough to marry good men and live happy ever after. But still, some other women found themselves in desperate situations that robbed them of their youth and sometimes of their lives. So male order actually benefited both the lonely prospectors and cowboys, but also the romance-seeking belle. One way for men living on the frontier to meet women was through subscriptions to heart and hand clubs, newspapers with information and photographs of women with whom they could correspond. Eventually a man might convince a woman to join him in the west, in matrimony, or a woman convinces the man. Social status, political connections, money, companionship, or security were often considered more than love in these arrangements. But some used these to genuinely connect and enjoyed a lengthy correspondence courtship. Some knew each other well and had courted prior to a separation or were connected by their respective families in different cities. We all have that auntie telling us she knows someone she likes for us. Although some matches ended in significant disaster, others yielded lasting contentment and happiness. In brief, Amazing women left hearth and home and traveled great distances to marry a man, and if they were lucky, it'd be one they'd fallen in love with through letters. And last but not least, homosexuality was no scandal at all. In fact, it was widely accepted, normalized, and not even questioned. Y'all think Brokeback Mountain came out of nowhere? Even though Victorians didn't write about it, homosexuality was very, very common then as it is today. But because the Victorians avoided the topic, Hollywood followed suit with depictions of the rugged cowboy and roguish western life that was simplified and manly. This modern erasure of homosexuality, as well as the racial whitewashing of the cowboy image, has long since been disproven by modern research. Archival photographs, memoirs, diaries, and more open attitudes have uncovered the shocking underworld of the West. Wild West society didn't necessarily label people as homosexual or heterosexual, but rather allowed each person to be who they needed to be in any given moment. With women especially not as present in large communities such as a mining camp, some men would fill the role of a woman for physical pleasure and domesticality and normal gender roles were challenged. This was recorded in Alfred Kinsley's 1948 study, Sexual Behavior in Human Male. This same study 
reported the highest frequencies of homosexual intimacy to be among men in the rural farming communities and that cowboys and miners even often coupled up in unions known as a bachelor marriage. Part of this comfortable acceptance comes from the exposure to the neighboring indigenous communities where we've always acknowledged two spirit, an indigenous exclusive multi-gender identity, or simply beyond the grasp of sexuality and gender labels. The concept of cross-dressing or same-sex partnership is completely normal. It's crazy to think how LGBTA people of the wild west may be quite scandalized by some of our modern world's present mindset towards them. Let's prepare for some western lovin' by first learning the rules of courtship. A cool thing to know is that women had a lot more rights without needing a man in the western frontier. You could own a business or land or be a bounty hunter or a sharpshooter or just as easily be a brothel keeper or a grocer. Ladies had range. But there was still a ratio of like 90 to 10 men to women on the frontier so the population had to happen somehow. Courtship required intent to avoid scandal. Young men, no matter how honorable a dandy or lowly a cowboy, must ask a young lady's male guardian for permission to court her. Courting held an inherent promise that said we are spending time together to see if we desire marriage. To be courting doesn't mean you're engaged, but it did signal to all others that the lady was spoken for. Essentially, it was dating. Not this modern version that's been butchered by the last few generations, but rather what we saw in TV classics like Seinfeld, where it was casual and comfortable, no determination on length, just seeing how you two fit together. Courting included meals with the woman's family, taking her on a sleigh or carriage ride, parlor games, reading aloud, and picnics were very popular, and courting actually made ice cream dates a thing. The Atkinson Daily Patriot printed the following ad on May 16th of 1881. It will also be in order to treat your girl to ice cream as often as once a month. Girls often exchanged things such as a locket, a coin, or even a bullet shell as a gift. If a couple was financially strapped, exchanging locks of hair was a memento as well. Oh, and also coffee. Cowboys sometimes hoarded coffee to impress women. You've learned the rules of courtship, now it's time to claim your lady by sparking and walking out. And no, that's not light a cigarette and leave the room. Sparking and walking out were acts of courting that signified deeper involvement. This is when we started getting to the relationship or engaged parameters. Sparking means to engage in courtship, but it was also a nickname for kissing in PDA, which the American West was considerably less prudish about than the East and South Victorians, seeing no scandal and a little touchy loving. This is particularly due to the scarce supply for women as forementioned. Walking out together is a little more like in the East and the South. Young ladies had a reputation to protect and parents will be parents, regardless of the time. Going on a walk or walking out meant that courting people could be in the public eye and therefore they could ditch a chaperone. Anywhere else this would have been a huge scandal, but on the frontier non-married couples would walk out in public to signify their claim and show mutual respect for it. Now anyone would know if someone was an unloyal partner and bonus, it's before you tie the knot. For a man to take his lady to an event, it could involve a lot of work. Ride into town, reserve a carriage, retrace the mileage back with the rig to collect the lady, then go back once more. That's a lot of time, labor, and dedication, and it's a true testament to the love many couples shared. Walking out remained a popular day even for the married. Gonna get down and dirty, then let's talk to it. Fun slang is up next. You and your lady done did your courting and are getting hitched. Time to impress her with some manly and sexy terminology. Cowboys had a way with words, so it's not too surprising that they used some pretty colorful terms to describe matters of the heart, and that included courting. Getting hitched was a serious business, and spooning or sparking no less. The vernacular was different back then, and lots of phrases and terms used that were common enough that even if they sound gibberish to us, they were full of comprehensive sentences then. A bunch of these are actually still used casually today. From a list of dirty wild west slang, here's a few recognizable terms. Screwing, fooling around, painted lady, and knocking boots. To get the wrong pig by the tail is dying out a little bit more now, but essentially means picking the wrong person for something. Meanwhile, some more creative and lesser heard slang terms are perooting, which means intercourse. Spooning, unlike now, actually meant intercourse, not cuddling. And a California woman was a term for a separated but not yet divorced woman. Get the mitten was a playful way to tease your homie about getting rejected. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June. Better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally 
you know, wash up. At the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen, everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse but back then you didn't get any Thing, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky, who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. So next up, the only way to learn was to learn by trying. That's right, the classic toss them in the deep end and watch them drown approach. Sure, you could get a vague idea as to what intercourse entails from living in towns that had literal brothels or semi-public intercourse, which we'll get to in a little bit, but it was mostly word of mouth or unhelpful packets called marriage manuals. These late 1800s safe sex brochures were laughably inaccurate and stressed the importance of only engaging in the activity during marriage. If you wanted to know anything beyond that, you'd have to learn by doing it yourself. As you've heard, it was pretty chill back then, so when it came down to some PDA and some romping, the whole abstinence pitch was about as useful as their killer contraceptives. There was no proper education on intimacy, which means not only did people not know enough about their parts, but they also had no knowledge of diseases that could come with them. These manuals also highlighted how self-given pleasure was unhealthy because of the use of human, you know, for anything other than procreation was frowned upon in the eyes of the Lord. This lack of education led to the use of their wily contraceptives and also the use of the next item on our list. Bundling, it's more than just getting cozy. An early custom of the Wild West, a courting couple who wanted to sleep beside one another but had yet to be married but still wanted to withhold from, well, carnal desire, they could bundle. It's exactly how it sounds. The courting people would literally burrito themselves in separate blankets or into a large fabric sack that tied around the neck and would allow them to sleep sinlessly next to each other or even cuddle. Now, I know what you're thinking, Teresa, that little bit of material isn't gonna stop no Tom Fool especially once cuddles get into the mix. Rest assured, I got you, because for those who really were tempted, you could also have a bundling board come into play to literally draw the line. It's a physical divider placed down the center of the bed to keep unmarried partners from touching completely. No sleeping sack to sleeping sack action with a two by four blocking the way. It allowed the two to talk all night and even see each other's faces. Sometimes you could cuddle kinda over it, but no intercourse was capable. Both bundling options let couples experience physical intimacy before their wedding, and it was great for when you visited your lady and she still lived at home in a shared bedroom. Number three, royal weddings. While poor class citizens did sometimes marry for love and support, and to have someone to go through life with as being a woman on her own back then would prove to be quite difficult. Uh, sometimes difficult more than it should have been. Medieval times set a very troubling precedent for those at the top. A lot of times, princes, princesses, kings, queens, and really anyone who held power or land were oftentimes married off to benefit that of a nation or a kingdom from which they came. In a nutshell, these marriages were political agreements, not holy matrimony, if you can call it that. Many times in history, nations swap sons and daughters in order to save a little skin. Some marriages might go sour over time, but imagine one that you didn't want to be in from the start. Oof, and if you speak up, your whole kingdom might collapse. Eee, yeah, not a good, not a good time, not a good scenario. Number two, witnesses. I've talked about it before, but it still doesn't make it any better or easier. Every person you see walking around today was created by a couple things: two people, a Barry White record, and a little bit of friction. Unless you're a test tube baby, sometimes like you're a clone in Camino, you know what I mean? And Star Wars, you know the, the big tube thing. Anyway, that's life. However, a lot of these moments are private, and they probably should be private, unless you're an exhibitionist or something. That's how you do things. Well, a lot of times for a marriage to become official, established members from your village or community would come and watch you consummate the marriage. Yes, that's right. Mom, dad, the bishop, heck, maybe even the grave digger down the road because he's got an important job. My question is, what do you say when that's happening? Do you cheer? Do you laugh? Do you 
Way to go, kid. You, yeah, that's, that, that's my boy. I don't, what do you do? It's so gross and, ah. Close the door, Dad. Number one, divorce by trial. My personal favorite on this list, divorce by trial or divorce by combat. Either or, same thing. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if divorce court had a little less paper signing and a little more club swinging? Sprinkle in a little bit of Hunger Games and bam, boom, you got yourself a medieval divorce. It was a fight until you had to call Dompe the Gravedigger. The wife had a sling and a stone, the man had a club and was stuck in a hole waist deep just to even the odds. May the better, may the better spouse win. Whoever was left alive afterwards, got to be live free and then now they were divorced because the other spouse was no longer breathing. Who would've, who would've thought, who would've known? That's crazy. Number 10, divorce. Today, divorces can go either which way. Way one, it's a brutal, awful experience for everyone around you. Words are exchanged, property is fought over, and by the end, two lawyers are a couple grand richer and now the kids get to say dad's house and mom's house. Wow, sounds awful. Or it can be a more pleasant experience where both parties mutually agree it's no longer working out and they do their best to have a peaceful separation on everyone's behalf. <sighs> That's nice and it does happen sometimes. Well, medieval marriage and divorce looked a lot different. Who would have thought? 800 years ago, who would have thought? The main part of divorce really was just being the annulment of the marriage, assuming it was allowed. Rules change depending on when and where it was. Whereas today, like my long-winded joke at the top of this segment, there's much to consider in a divorce, especially the estate. That's probably the main thing, is, is the stuff. It's all about the stuff. The marriage itself is the least of people's worries today. But back then, it was just about just not being married anymore. I want the bricks in the house. Like, what are you gonna, in medieval times, what are you gonna fight over? Like, I want the cows, the cows is mine. Number nine, off with the head. Another way to solve the issue of divorce and marriage was to get rid of your spouse. The same way Polly Walnuts got rid of Mikey Palmis. Gabish. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Most famously, King Henry VIII dispatched a few of his wives as the church really gave him no other way out of the marriages he found himself in. So, you know, up with the head. However, I think it's important to note that King Henry wasn't the only bloated throne sitter to have his wives dealt with soprano style. Things weren't exactly fair for women back then, or at all. Least of all, the law. It didn't have everyone's best interest and justice in mind, especially women. So there was a good chance that the king didn't like you. <laughs> you were gone. Happened all over. Number eight, adultery. There you were, standing like a wallflower at your town's clubhouse. Ours was called the Lions Club. You know what I'm talking about, small towns. Wearing a little old thing your sister lent you. Cowboy boots clatter as the music gets quieter. Then a handsome young man wearing jeans all over took you by the hand. Oh, romantic. You've been together ever since. I'm sure I, I literally just nailed that for some people. That's pretty much how they're married now. Except now he's not as charming. Now he's got a beer gut and he farts in his sleep. Ugh. Oh well, that's married life. I'm sure the medieval people went through a very similar process. What am I getting at? Well, when you get married, it means you're with that person forever. That includes the bedroom. Well, kings and queens of yieldy times ignored that rule. Besides the obvious political reasons for marrying, which I'll get to later, what was the point of marrying for love if you're just gonna have 30 mistresses or a secret lover? I would list the kings and queens who partook in this, but it would simply be easier to list those that didn't partake in that. You know what I mean though? What's the point? What's the whole point of doing it? If you're just gonna, yes, we love you together forever and then, how you doing? It just doesn't make any sense. Number seven, soldier on trial. Things weren't all bad for ladies back in medieval times. Sometimes they were given the benefit of the doubt. Like in medieval France, for example, where if a woman did desire a divorce, there was a non-violent way to get one. She and her husband would meet in front of a group for proceedings regarding their marital prowess in the bedroom. Of course, why else would I be talking about it? Meaning she had to prove that he could not prove himself a man in the bedroom. Happens to a lot of guys. In a nutshell, that means a group of people would handle, grab, stare, and examine a man's gabagool, piche de deal, sausage, Woody the Woodpecker, the Olive Branch, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Ballpark Hot Dog, the Ambassador, the Trombone, the One-Eyed Bob, and the Heat Seeking Trouser Rocket. That's a, <laughs> That's a <laughs> You guys get the point. It was a very embarrassing process, but if he couldn't produce results in front of prying eyes, then, well, that means she's leaving. 
Can you imagine that? Number six, no Irish grandma. In society, we've decided that there are rules and laws and just rules that really just need to be followed in order to have an effective society. Like no harming others or laws that help keep us safe. However, there are some laws that just don't need to be said. Some rules are self-explanatory, like no diving in shallow water. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to hurt yourself. No pooping in public. Of course not. I would never. I promise. And you can't marry your nan. That's right, you can't marry your nan. Yes, that's right. A law from medieval Ireland hits us with a marriage law stating that no man shall marry the wife of his granddad. You see, that's one you didn't have to tell us. We knew that. I knew that. Everybody knew that. Marriage laws were changing at the time because of English rule and a lot of other laws were changing too, but the close family nature of their marriages, well, things got a little confusing. It was just about the time. I'm not allowed to say in sound things, but it was in that's what it was. So they, they were changing laws. It was kind of gross. Ugh. Now I feel gross talking about it. In our number five spot today, we have wedding baths. This is one of the most serious of all of the wedding traditions that were seen in ancient Greece, and it was a key part of the pre-wedding rituals for brides-to-be. This ritual bath involved water being carried in a special ceremonial vase called the lutrophore to the bride's chamber for this bathing practice. This ritual was actually so important to the people of the time that much of the time, should a young woman meet an untimely fate before being married, they would still perform this bathing ritual on the woman post-mortem. Sometimes they would even be buried with the ceremonial vase as well, even though they had never had the chance to marry. This ceremony was intended to purify the bride and also to enhance her ability to have children. It was seen as the most important milestone in a girl's journey from adolescence into adulthood. In our number four spot today, we have courtly love. So we've discussed a bit about how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land and really didn't have much, if anything, to do with love. This would obviously be a less than ideal way of living, so to make things a little more bearable, there was the practice of courtly love. This, of course, was for members of the court and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. Sex, of course, was forbidden, however, because there are some boundaries while you're married, all right? It's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this, all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love. I am glad, though, that they were able to have some kind of freedom, I guess. In our number three spot today, we have double consanguinity. Double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources, meaning some sort of familial relationship from two places. This was important in medieval times because it was common for two siblings in one royal family to marry two siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways of living and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would seemingly be nothing wrong with it during those times in history. In our number two spot today, we have the Viking party. Okay, we've all been to a wedding before where we maybe got a little too loose, had a little too much fun, but let me tell you right now, no one did it like the Vikings. An important aspect of a Viking wedding ceremony was mead. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink a specially brewed bride ale together at the feast that took place after the wedding ceremony. It was an important step in making sure that the marriage was a binding one. The happy couple would need to ensure sure that there was at least a month's worth of ale ready for the wedding day and it needed to be continually drunk throughout their honeymoon as well. The first serving of the bride ale was presented to the groom by his new wife in what was known as the loving cup. Before the groom takes his first sip, he would likely consecrate the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it and a toast to Odin. Then he would sip the ale before passing the cup to his wife. She would then make a toast to Freya before having her sip and then it was officially party time.
In our number one spot today, we have purity. Of course, women have been subject to the weird standards of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it was so bad in the medieval times that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre because we would be here all day, but I will talk about this test that they felt necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers which is very weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked for blood. For people who were lower class, they didn't usually have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I truly hope that this one is actually untrue. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, Boom Boom Pow, OMG Wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching a live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey, and Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up, so if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number 9, Dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, then people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, accepted. We will get to that later. 
For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the Speak Now or Forever Hold Your Peace was introduced. At number six, Shoes! Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings and apparently whoever cast it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now, this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever, so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't wanna do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the sixth century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored. Then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you are going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. 
But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore. Because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them, a little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength, because they were Rock hard, and obviously, you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. 